Okay. Mm. So I don't know who would like to start just by saying, you know, who you are and why you're mm. here. Okay. Mm. Your introduction. Okay. Um, What's what? Mm. I'm Ted, I'm Stephen's father. Um, this is sorry. my daughter Charlotte, mm. Stephen's mm. sister. This is her husband Richard, mm. both heavily involved in the family. And of course, mm. my dear wife, Patricia. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> and you get called Patricia when people are cross with me. And Stephen Stop. obviously can't speak, mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. we'll have to introduce him. Um, Stephen is 52 years old. Mm. Um, he's the middle child mm. of mm. the three of us. I have an older sister, mm. um, older than both of us, um, and she lives in Greece. Mm. And I'm um, 12 years younger than Stephen. Um, mm. My brother was the only child um, who my mum was mm. dogs with, and my sister and I are both perfectly healthy. Um, so mm. that's, I think it's the starting point for us. Mm. Mm. Yeah. What do you want to say? Yes, well, um, mm. Um, mm. when I found that I was pregnant with Stephen, I, I mm. obviously went to the doctors quite early, and he said, Oh, mm. we've got a new. Pregnancy test, he said, mm. it's, um, perfectly safe. Do you know harm if it does you know good? You know, he said, uh, it's just two tablets to take on consecutive days, and mm. um, you either have a period or you don't. If you don't, then you mm. He said, it saves waiting three weeks for the rabbit mm. to die. This mm. was the rabbit test with you at that time. Um, mm. So, obviously, you know. You're eager to know, <laughs> to have it confirmed. Mm. Although I was being sick all the while, so that was, you know, I thought mm. I'm not pregnant, I'm dying or something awful, but mm. <laughs> I felt. Um, and, um, you know, mm. just obviously I've been with the doctor since I was 12 mm. years old. <coughs> so you trust your doctor, mm. obviously. Um, <coughs> you trust that mm. what's being done is in your best mm. interest and no one else is. But when he gave mm. me the, the tablets, he opened his, his drawer, mm. his desk drawer, and just gave me the, the tablets on a card. No instructions, mm. no contraindications. Mm. Because I wouldn't even take an aspirin for a headache. You know, so mm. obviously I wouldn't have taken anything that I could, mm. but any time would have, would have endangered mm. the child. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm. Um, and then, then Stephen was born with severe brain damage. Well, mm. uh, yes, it was, you know, it was a normal birth. Mm. Um, quite a quick birth, actually. Mm. But um, he mm. started to have these jerks, which mm. at first the doctor put down to wind, mm. you know, that his eyes would roll a little bit as, as babies do when, mm. when they've got the wind. Um, so, mm. it's like it yourself really, I think, you don't want to face that it's anything different. Mm. Um, and then he started mm. to have um, proper seizures. Mm. Um, in fact, it, it was, it was mm. around Christmas Eve, I think, wasn't it all? When we, mm. we actually wrapped him up in a blanket and took him mm. to the doctor's house. You know, and mm. knocked on his door and said, Look what's mm. anyway. I mean, he was brilliant, he got a party on, and he just said, um, mm. Come this way, and took us through to his study, through to the mm. study. And um, mm. he said that he thought it was epilepsy mm. petty mal, didn't he? But, um, but obviously, no, for no reason. Yeah. Um, if uh, if I can digress just yes, a little please. bit on what, what Pat has just mentioned, um, initially um, just after Stephen was born, um, Pat could obviously feel these jerks that she just described when she was when Stephen was in her arms. We took Stephen to the doctors on several occasions, and he could find nothing wrong. Then we get to the part where what Pat had just mentioned, we were so worried about Stephen, it was a Christmas night. Yeah. We took him to the GP's private house, 
large house in the, in large grounds. And uh, I'm just telling you that bit because when we knocked the door and he opened the front door, he stood there and he, he, there was one of these uneasy silences. It sounded, he just looked at us and it seemed like a couple of minutes, but it was obviously just a couple of seconds and he's still looking at us, never said a word. And he said, coming through, well, there was, it was a black tie do, there were uh, ladies in ball gowns and what have you, and credit due to the doctor, he took us straight through into his private shooter at the back of the house, gave Stephen a thorough examination and looked at us again with one of those uneasy silences and he, then he said, you can obviously feel something that I can't. He said, what we'll do is I'll make arrangements for you to see a paediatrician which, uh, which happened quite quickly and we saw what was the leading uh, paediatrician in the city at that time and now as soon as he had Stephen's details he had no qualms whatever in, in fact his actual words were take him home, it'll never work for you that was the diagnosis from the paediatrician but he was fully aware of what we've got now Mm -hmm. Okay, that I'm sorry, but I thought no, I'd fill in that. <coughs> it must be really um, hard for you in the early days having um, Nikki, my older yeah. sister. It yeah. must have been really yeah, well, hard. she was four years old. And Stephen spent four months in hospital with them trying to control the fits. They put him on an, um, some injections called ACTH, which did stop the seizures. But as soon as they took him off them, they started again. Um, the side effect of these seizures was that he, he grew hair, body hair. So he got, you know, his arms were like fur, you know, he, so he couldn't stay on it anyway. And it's only a short term thing. Um, and they tried him on, well, went through the whole book of, of drugs that were available. Um, but I mean, it, it was very difficult then because Stephen was in hospital, was in there for four months. I got my eldest daughter was four. I got nobody to look after her. Ted had to go to work. He he worked shifts, and um, so I had to. They let they wouldn't let Nicky go into a little side ward where he could be observed, but nobody ever observed him. You know. <laughs> They were all too busy on the ward, and because I was there, they didn't try to keep a um, monitor of his seizures. And uh, what they would allow me to do was prop the door open of this little side ward, and Nikki sat outside with her colouring books all day, you know, for, for hours on end mm -hmm. while I was with him, because I had to be with him because his seizures weren't being monitored. So the only way I could be sure that, because that if I wasn't there, they'd say, we hasn't had any. <coughs> but I was, well, what exactly are you looking yeah. for? That's the point. Yeah. When um, we actually became yeah. aware of Stephen's problems, um, at that particular time, we, um, Euphoria, a new baby in the house, we said, irrespective of problems, no matter what they are, come what may, we will take care of Stephen. Yeah. Um, little did we realise at the time that the magnitude of the commitment that we were making. And uh, today, all, all that has been realised, of course. Yeah. <coughs> and now, uh, Stephen's 52, yeah. and with the mentality probably of a two or three year old. So we've got a 52 year old toddler <coughs> on our hands. And we, <coughs> you have to excuse me, I'm frogging my throat. Um, um, what we're doing now is, um, I'm 82, my wife is 77, and Stephen is 24-7. Yeah, we can't wash, dress, feed, or anything himself. So we're doing full-time care at our particular age. It makes life very difficult, as I'm sure you can understand. And what about you, Sean? Is impact on you? Um, well, I mean, I've... I'm not going to give you a sub story about my childhood because my parents are mm. incredible. Um, they gave me a great upbringing. It may have been unconventional at times um, with Stephen, but um, I, I had a, a great childhood. 
if actually but if I just interrupt for one second your interests gave us our sanity you're such positive people though Charlotte I mean, skied and we made sure that she didn't miss because she wanted to ski we would go to the ski slopes and to the Alps even we've, we've, yeah. we've driven all through Europe with Stephen in the car you know blowing raspberries at the border guards and then with the guns <laughs> over their shoulder and us not speaking any, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the language and all I could think of to say, because there was the, it was sitting there with his feet upon the dashboard blowing raspberries with opera blaring out because he loves opera. And, <coughs> and all I could think of to say was, mal la tête, you know, it was a little bit of French from school. <laughs> Ah, 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 all right, go on, go on, go on through it. But, um, you know, but with me, Stephen had a lot of good quality of life because of ski, ski, Charlotte's hobby, because he was involved and we wanted to make sure that Charlotte you, did. You've always made it, made it work, you know, yeah. you're always being positive and you still are now, despite everything and how utterly impossible your life is, you're still fighting it all and positive. Um, you know, these people are pillars of the community. Um, they're well respected wherever they go. Despite all this, they've still managed to raise thousands of pounds for charity over the years and give Nikki and I as normal as possible a childhood. They're incredible. But recently, um, since Dad's, I apologise, Dad, um, okay. since his heart failure, he's you know, uh, it, they're struggling now at 77 and 82, looking after a 52-year-old baby with the washing, the dressing, the feeding, the lugging wheelchairs in and out of cars, you know. It's physically exhausting and emotionally draining for them. Mm -hmm. Richard and I lived in Southampton. Uh, we've been, we've done that for 12 years. Um, but we've had to move back to uh, the area because it was becoming stressful for me I'm not saying they can't cope I'm just saying from my own personal point of view I was too stressed being so far away and for the future I need to be closer to them if they need me going forward so that is a major impact our daughter's very unhappy about the move we've had to move our business and our whole life <laughs> um, and also I inherit their life um, you know, Stephen one day will become, his care will become my responsibility. And I adore my brother. I absolutely adore him. I will do anything for him. Um, and I will give him the best life that I possibly can. But it's a life sentence. You know, it, the effect of this drug, it's multi-generational. It just goes on and on and on. Would it be useful to sort of describe the level of care that Stephen yeah, has? Um, and yeah, I mean, Stephen's seizures are really bad, aren't they? Um, medicine can't control them. Um, he has multiple seizures of all different types all day. He doesn't sleep at night. Um, my mum stays up with him all night, and my dad stays up with him half the night. Then mum goes to bed in the morning for a few hours. Um, this is their their routine. Um, just this week, if I'm just giving an example of this week, um, Stephen had a drop fit and my dad was holding him and he pulled him over and they smashed into the fire grate, didn't they? <laughs> so dad's got a lump on his head, he's bruised his shoulder, his ribs, he's, he, Stephen's born on him and either broken or bruised his ribs several times this year. Um, he's on blood thinners, you know, and then the other night he was stuck in seizures um, and he had to have medazolam his rescue medication. But every time he came out of a seizure, midazolam doesn't really work on him anymore, to be honest. Um, it lessens the seizures, but it doesn't really stop them, does it? No, it was a particularly um, bad session. It was a bad session, and my poor brother was in a real mess, you know, because unfortunately with the large, larger seizures, he can soil himself. Mm -hmm. And then we had an instance where trying to get him clean when he was in and out of seizures, because he would just, he'd be fine one minute, and then he'd just drop again. Um, so it took three of us to try and hold him 
and clean him and then as he went into another seizure to drop him back down and then start all over again it took you know hours to just try and change him you were away for three hours yeah but mm. these they're 77 and 82 years old and they are still doing this and their care is being cut because of cutbacks he used to go to a day center five days a week he can now only go four he can't go into respite because they can't handle him he's too ill they just call my mum and dad out in the middle of the night to pick him up because they can't cope with these seizures. Um, so they have two nights, six a week, which is an absolute godsend, but it's so painful to watch them struggle. Mm -hmm. They need some more help, you know? And to think that this was caused by a drug. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, this was 40 contraceptive pills. And I'd ask anybody now that if you were eight weeks pregnant and you were given 40 contraceptive pills, would you take them? <coughs> and if you did, would you question why your child was like Stephen? You know? I'm, I'm fed up of having this, <coughs> this argument. I'm fed up with hiding, people hiding away. <coughs> Get off my soapbox now. Okay, <laughs> just ask folks. Probably a ridiculous question. Your hopes for the future? Yeah. Well, you clearly got concerns for the future. Oh, yes. It's a scary it's place, place, isn't it? Well, it is because if people can't cope with Stephen for one night in respite care or during the day, what chance is there for a residential or anything? That you know they wouldn't be able to do it. The protocol, the council's <coughs> protocol says they send for an ambulance and take him to hospital each time he has a seizure. Well, he always has some seizures after after lunch. That's you do dozes off to sleep and then he'll he'll wake up and have minor ones. But um, you know, they're not allowed to keep him in case he dies in the seizure and they don't want to be responsible. That's the top and bottom of it. I think Stephen's such a special it's, case that they don't uh, understand how to, uh, the hospitals don't understand how to deal with him, so they have to rely on mum and dad's advice. And in terms of my brother being able to be in any kind of residential home, it, he's so unique that it, it takes years of being around him, mm. doesn't it? Yeah, For you to understand to how to keep him safe yeah. and to understand, you know, his seizure patterns and his, his, his uniqueness. Well, well if I can just yeah. emphasise what my child like is describing now we as parents question the wisdom of social services when they will not give us any more than two nights sits so we can get sleep they tell us that if Stephen if we need more than two nights mm. with Stephen then he, he should have residential care now the cost everybody knows to keep a child at home as opposed to residential care is fractional it's ridiculous uh, I mean, um, we know everything comes down to funding at the end of the day, but in, what we're doing at home must be saving social services thousands, as opposed to what it would cost in residential care. You know? oh, I just thought I'd emphasise that point, because this is what we're actually dealing with right now, mm -hmm. is trying to get some more night's sleep, actually. The two nights that we get, we look forward to like Christmas Day, you know? Mm -hmm. <coughs> What makes me angry as well is that my mum was let down, my brother was let down 52 years ago and they're still being let down now. Mm -hmm. When is somebody going to do something, you know, you can't let these people suffer like this. And there's hundreds of people like it, these thousands more coming forward all the time, you know, you have to do something, you can't just, you can't just ignore this. You know, all we want is the truth. <coughs> You know, there's no amount of money that's going to give my brother his life back. No, it's not. It, it, it's irrelevant, you know? They've ruined our lives anyway. But we, we want the truth. And there are so many children that are like Stephen that have took Primagos that uh, at meetings that we obviously mm. hold, um, different parents have got up and said their piece. And they're all carbon copies of each other. Mm. He's, the first meeting that I went to when I heard one young mother get up and 
and described what she was having. I thought she was talking about my son, you know, and this is pretty general across the board. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I think what, what's awful as well about this is that the onus has always been on the victims to prove causality of this drug. And it's not right. You know, the, the regulatory failure of, on this, you know, is crystal clear. And in, in that respect, I really do think that the government should be going and asking them to prove that it was safe, not putting the fight on. Why should, why should people this age, who are struggling to get through every day, have to go and lobby their own peace? And, you know? It's just, it's a really bad situation for everybody. But I will not be a victim, which is why I know. we do what we can, you know, to to raise awareness and to, to put on events for other carers and that so that they can get together and and have um, you know, put on a cup of coffee and a cake and it's yeah. you know, and, and get speakers in to, you know, to talk about health and 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 social services and what's what's available. So, you know, at least we feel we can do something positive because they're not gonna make me a victim. Yeah. Body. Oh. They've tried that one and it's not going to work. <laughs>